Let's open our Bibles to the book of Acts. In order to understand the life of David, it's always very, very insightful to get God's estimation of him, especially reflected in the New Testament. Last time we saw the the summary of his life, he fulfilled God's purpose. Tonight, in the 22nd verse of Acts 13, it's probably the most famous designation of David, and I would like that to to kind of be the backdrop for all that we see this evening as we look at the life of David and especially the the context of the Psalms. And I hope and I pray that every Psalm that David wrote, that we know what he wrote it about, will become a real treasure in all of our lives. He wrote about 30 or 31 Psalms that tell us exactly what was going on in his life, which is chronicled in uh, both Samuel and the book of Chronicles. And so it just adds great insight. But, but in Acts 13, in verse 22, it's amazing that of the almost 3,000 people that are chronicled in the Bible, biographically men and women, that one exceeds them all. And that's this one that the 22nd verse says, And when he, that's God, had removed him, that's Saul, he raised up for them David, as king. And so David just didn't do anything except what the Lord wanted him. The Lord raised him up, and that's the best way to get any position. Let the Lord give it to you. Don't, you know, make your own way. Let him raise you up. So he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he, that's God, gave testimony and said. I love this. God is testifying. It's almost like a law court scene. And, you know, they have the Lord, you know, check in and say he's going to tell the truth. And then he gives his testimony. And this is the Lord's testimony of David. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. You know, I like the New Testament version of that. Did you know... Even though forever settled in heaven is David's failures and sin and adultery and murder, he actually broke all ten of the commandments, all of them, through that incident with Uriah and Bathsheba and the whole deal. And yet, look at the New Testament God of mercy and grace's testimony. It's kind of a little insight into how the Lord looks at us this side of the cross. He says, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. And it's amazing, even in the Chronicles, when a similar statement is made by God, it says that David did all the will of God except in the incident with Uriah and Bathsheba. So he was such a powerful man. And that's why he has this life most noticed by God. And as we go in tonight, just to give you an understanding of what we're going to start, David's life is basically in three pieces in the Bible. The most noticed life is in three parts. His youth, his hard years of running and fleeing and and being hounded for his very life and fighting all kinds of battles, and then the consequence years, from the consequences of becoming the king and the consequences of the the adultery situation with Bathsheba and the consequences of what that plays out in his family and the consequences of being a man after God's own heart. All of those things are the final sector. So tonight we'll probably just see the youth and then we'll see the hard years and then we'll see the concluding years and then come back and go through those actual 30 Psalms, one each time. They're, they're the product of a very very vivid scene in David's life that he worships God's through. But we know more about David's words, nor more about his thoughts, more about his fears, his strengths, his weaknesses, than anybody else in the Bible. And we know about them through the filter, the lens, through the analysis of God. And it's just marvelous to see it from that perspective. We know one important thing for sure. It's what God tells us about David. God tells us that David was God's man. 
And that's, that's very significant because no matter what we do in our life, remember the Bible summarizes key people, especially the kings of Israel and Judah, usually with one word. Either they did what was right in the sight of the Lord or they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. God summarizes their whole life with a word, good or evil. Kind of like what we saw a few weeks ago, the judgment seat of Christ, that we will receive for what we've done in our life, whether it be good or bad. Good or evil in the Old Testament is either they were righteous or they were lost, pagan sinners that are going to suffer forever. In the New Testament, either we're good, clothed in Christ's righteousness, and we, from that, produce works that will endure forever, which are good, or they're worthless, as we saw. So it's interesting what grace does. It isn't a measure of whether we're going to heaven or hell. It's whether what we've done will last or it won't. But David was after God's own heart, and David was a servant of God for all of his life, even in his weakness and sin. Well, let's go through the big events of David's life. And if you want to uh, turn in your Bibles, turn back to 1 Samuel 16, because that's the first time we pick up uh, with David. And uh, there's one common denominator, and I want you to see it tonight. And the common denominator of the earthly struggles of David was that David was constantly lonely. Sociologists tell us that one of the most painful experiences in life is loneliness. Uh, Loneliness aches and gnaws and eats away at people. Other things you can kind of, uh, you know, get rid of after a while. Fear is, you know, get a gun or security system, you know, and, and, and pain you can, you know, mask it with something else. But loneliness just seems to come under the door and through the windows. It just... It doesn't seem to go away. And David lived most of his life painfully alone. Uh, and, and we'll see, it starts right here in chapter 16. But the Holy Spirit inspired David to write over 30 psalms that capture how the Lord was his refuge, especially when he faced the constant pain of, of loneliness, the constant fears for even his existence, his continued existence, his life, the constant hurts of betrayal, of slander. I mean, David was, was just viciously slandered, and, and he wrote psalms during all those. And, and he was betrayed by his own son and by his closest confidants and everything else. But David suffered, and he suffered whether from being the youngest of the boys in a family with all the normal rivalries and jealousies and troubles. And we'll see that right here in chapter 16. He was the youngest, and and he had all the the, uh, typical problems of that family. Or for the long work hours that he was forced to to serve far away from everybody. Because he was the youngest, he got the hardest job. He had to go out alone in the wilderness and watch the family flock. And and he had that, that away time, far away from everybody else. And David for whatever reason, spent an immense amount of time alone. And and I think as we go through these Psalms, a lot of people spend a lot of time alone, and most people waste a lot of time alone. But David is an example to us of how to redeem time, and it's wonderful. And then from his army days of fighting for Saul, David was often on the battlefield. He was often tracking down enemies, and he was often in a little commando group. And again, he's alone in lonely places. And then he has the years of running from Saul, hiding for his own safety from so many dangers. He was under constant threat of traitors, Saul's planted people that would spy on him, and of spies and of enemies producing another long era of loneliness in his life. I I mean, First it was loneliness in his family and his job, and then it was loneliness serving the king, and then it was loneliness of being on the run. And it just just constantly was there. And then there was also this the the desert and wilderness times that, that he just had to go through just for normal life. Sometimes he was he was uh, hiding in the desert or he was in a cave or he was going to see his family in Edom. And, and again, there's those travel times that, he was alone. And then you get into his long career, and as a king, he had even more lonely days. Leadership in itself is often a lonely position. I mean, when you're the king, a lot of times everybody thinks that, you know, you're so busy, they just go on with life, and the king was alone. 
very much alone. But add to that the pressures of a multi-wife family. How would you like that pressure? Uh, A multi-wife family? Uh, I mean, it's often hard to understand one, you know? Uh, Can you imagine having many, uh, like David did, and and have them vying over whose son was going to be, you know, the top dog son of the family? And then raising strong-willed children. David had strong-willed children. I mean, one rapes their own sister, another one murders his brother, another one tries to murder dad. I mean, that's a, that's a very lonely place. I mean, one of, his, one of his wives, his first, by the way, Michael, just mocked him, didn't respect him. Uh, it, you know, it just, he just struggled from the, from the closest relationships. And on and on it went. And then he had the constant drumbeat of wars. He had the searing pain of his adultery. And all of that, the family, the wives, the sin, the responsibilities as king and all the enemies, made a constant drain. And David was alone through almost all of that. I mean, he had advisors and everything else, but his psalms reflect him saying, Who do I have but you? I have nowhere to go. No one cares for my soul. He felt so alone. But the habits of David's youth never left him. David had very simple habits. When he was afraid, even as a child, he learned to trust in God. And when David was at the end of himself and didn't know what to do, he turned to God. And when David felt alone, he felt he could could never escape the Spirit of God. Remember what he said, whither shall I go from thy presence and where shall I go from your spirit? If, if I make my bed, he said, in the grave, you'll even be there. David had simple faith, simple habits. David was a lifelong seeker and finder of the Lord because he loved him. And all that is what we find captured by the Scriptures and vividly portrayed in the Psalms. The Psalms are the songs that come out of events, of good and bad events in David's life. And those songs capture what he learned in those hard times. Well, First Samuel 16, 1 through 13, is our first look at David. And, and I want you to see... When the pages of Scripture open in his life, the first scene we see in David's life, these first 13 verses, are sad at best. By modern standards, we would say that that David's family was abusive to him. But he probably didn't even know he was abused. But David was basically, in these first 13 verses of 1 Samuel 16, overlooked by his family, ignored by his family, and disliked by many members of his own family. So overlooked, ignored, and disliked. But from that lonely time when he could have gotten embittered, David chose to seek the one he felt would never leave him alone, that would never ignore him, and would never dislike him. You see, David turned every adversity. If he had a family that ignored and disliked and and just didn't have anything to do with him, then he knew there's one that would never neglect him and ignore him and dislike him. And he said, Lord, my enemies, my own family, my own brothers are like this, but you're not. See how he just, he just turned. He turned every, every trial in his life in a platform to somehow praise the Lord. David used a simple instrument. And as we look in the scriptures, it talks about his harp in verse 13. And it, it says that, uh, that David, from verse 13, when the Spirit of God anointed him, began using that harp, and if you zip down to verse 18, he was skillful in playing, and by the time verse 23 comes of chapter 16, David would take that harp and used it as a tool in ministry. And that harp was the, the, the instrument upon which these songs, these psalms, these poems... These offerings of worship to God were offered. Well, 1 Samuel 16, we're going to read the first 13 verses. And let's meet 
the man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears, he'll kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. And then invite Jesse to the sacrifice. Now I'll show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I named to you. You can kind of tell the Lord was enjoying this. Didn't tell him which one. Didn't tell him how many there were either. So Samuel did what the Lord said, verse 4, and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably I have come to sacrifice the Lord. Sanctify therefore yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And so it was when they came that he looked at Eliab. And he said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't look at his appearance or at his physical stature. I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For the Lord, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Hmm. So that means the, the best partner in life is not always the one that's outwardly beautiful, but it's always the one that's inwardly beautiful because the Lord says that's what counts. Verse 8, So Jesse called Aminadad and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made Shammah pass. And the Lord said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord hasn't chosen these. And Samuel was starting to get a little concerned because that was a full set of seven. And none of them were right. Verse 11, and then Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? And he said, oh, there remains yet the youngest. And he is keeping, there he is keeping the sheep. You notice that one of the greatest honors of this family's life, that the representative of God, a man before whom the nation trembled, named Samuel, who was the mouthpiece for God, the representative of God, the man who could call storms from heaven and defeat the Philistines without a single sword, Samuel came to town, and Jesse got to honor, have the honor of his life of having Samuel there. And Jesse said, or Samuel said, bring your sons. And he didn't bring David. It shows they didn't think very much of David. They thought he was unimportant. It's interesting. Verse 11, and Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? And he said, ah, oh, there remains the youngest. You know, read between the lines, a loser, you won't want to check him out. We aren't interested in him. And there he is. You know, he points, he's out keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down. You see how uncomfortable it was? I mean, he went through this whole process and they all are shaking. He says, you, you can't even sit until you do what you were supposed to do in the beginning till he comes here. Verse 12, then he sent and brought him. Now he was ruddy. Uh, the background of that Hebrew word, it could even mean that he was a redhead. Can you imagine a redheaded Jew? I mean, wow. But he was ruddy. He had bright eyes. And he was good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. Can you imagine? Ah, bothered him so much, I'm sure. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. And Saul arose and went to Ramah. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we love your word. Thank you that we, we can see that scene. You breathed it out through your holy prophets. You recorded it in your word and preserved it, and you brought it to this very day. And as we read it, we can hear your voice. And I pray as we meet this man after your own heart, this one that, that you loved, and that you smiled upon, and that your spirit rested upon from that day onward when he was anointed, that we would learn life-impacting, life-changing lessons through what you have planned for us to learn in your word because of David's life. We ask that you start 
in every one of our lives tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want you to think about the significance of verse 13, because as far as we know, all of these psalms begin flowing from David's life with that 13th verse. Because David later says in verse 2 of chapter 23 that the Spirit of the Lord was upon me and spoke by me. So he confessed that when the Spirit of God came by, upon him, that the Spirit of God began speaking by him. And so the Psalms we're looking at, specifically the 30-plus we're going to, to look at in this life of David time, and specifically the ones we're going to survey tonight, all flow from this event when David was anointed and the Spirit of God stayed upon him from that time onward. David uses that simple instrument, starting in verse 14, uh, the harp. Actually, it's the word kinneroth. That's the word that is used for the Sea of Galilee. It's called the Kinnereth Sea. And, and if you stand on a mountain high enough in Galilee, the Arbel Cliff is a good example, and look down, the Sea of Galilee is shaped like a harp. And so we, from the Sea of Galilee, we know the shape of this instrument because that's what it was named after. It was named after the Kinnerot, the, the harp-shaped sea. And so David used this lyre or this harp as a tool to offer his praises and worship to God. And instead of wasting his hours of monotonous work, look at verse 11. There he is with the sheep. And so he was with the sheep. And, and so instead of wasting those hours, he seems to have taken this simple little instrument and sharpened the skills God had given him. And he did it so, so well that people took note of it. Keep following along your Bible with verse 14. And what a contrast. And by the way, the Old Testament is written specifically and structurally to give us lessons. Verse 13, the Spirit of God comes upon David. Look at verse 14, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Do You see those are side by side. It's a very graphic, very very uh, poignant picture of, of the man after God's own heart has his spirit, the man chosen by man and, and the, the man that was chosen by the people because he was big and powerful looking and taller than anybody else. The spirit of God departed from him. Sad thing. A colossal misfit was Saul. And a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant says to him, Surely a depressing spirit from God is troubling you. Let our master now command your servants and, that are before you and seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp. And it shall be that he will play it with his hand. And when the distressing spirit from God is upon you, you shall be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Now this is going on far away. This is going on in the king's palace. And, and this is, this is um, nothing that's on the Internet or the news or anywhere else, and they didn't have telephones, and it just shows this structurally what God is doing. God had his plan, and he had his program, he had his man. And, and you don't have to do a lot of advertising and promotion if God is in it. God was going to use David. So watch what happens. So Saul said to his servant, Provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Verse 18, one of the servants answered and said, Look, I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. He is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, a handsome person, and the Lord is with him. Wow. David, who his brothers didn't even like him, David who stuck out there, somehow this person, God, intersected their paths. Isn't that wonderful how the Lord works? Remember this, God has your phone number. God has your address. He is orchestrating all things and working them together for good. If we just let Him, trust Him, wait upon Him, act in step with His Spirit. So, therefore, Saul sent a messenger, verse 19, to Jesse, and said, send me your son David, who is with the sheep. Can you imagine what's going on in that house? First Samuel makes everybody scared to death and quaking. And Jesse had left David out there. And so now a messenger comes from even worse than Samuel, the king himself. We want David. Wow. Look what it says in verse 19. Who is with the sheep. You know, David is a very humble guy. I know that you've 
thought of this and heard this before, but it, I can't read that without thinking about why David was after God's own heart. David had just got anointed by the most powerful prophet priest, Samuel, who dumped oil on his head in the front, in the presence of all of his relatives, his family, his dad. I'm sure there were the notables of Bethlehem were there watching. And, and here is David with the oil poured out and the Holy Spirit comes upon him. It's like a little mini Pentecost. And Samuel, if you notice what he says, he anoints him and, and he tells them that this is the one. This is the one that, that God has chosen. And so David had some sense that that there was something great, that that he was coming up to be the king. And look what he does in this next verse. He is right there with, verse 19, the sheep. You see, he goes right back to his sheep tending. You know what a lot of us would have done? We would have moved into the house and said, someone else take care of the sheep, I'm the future king, you know? Can you see the, the, the absence of pride in his life? He's still with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey and loaded it with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by his son David to Saul. And David came to Saul and stood by him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Please let David stand before me. He's found favor in my sight. And so it was. Whenever the Spirit from God was upon him, David would take a harp, and he would play it with his hand, and Saul would be refreshed and well. And the distressing spirit would depart from him. Do you know what I believe David did? David would sing the songs that were composed in his life from verse 13, from when the spirit came on him. And those songs are what I'd like to start with tonight. So let's turn to one of them. Let's turn to Psalm 19. And we're going to look at as many of these as we can tonight. But Psalm 19 is one of the songs that David wrote. And most likely from the hours out in the wilderness watching the sheep and the long nights guarding them from the from all the critters, the wolves and the bears and the lions, David had spent a lot of time under the stars as that young shepherd boy. And David was inspired after the Spirit came the Holy Spirit came on him in chapter sixteen, verse thirteen. David was inspired to begin writing spirit-prompted songs that captured truths about God that God revealed to David. David was just the willing tool. He was out there looking at the sheep, looking at the stars, thinking about the God that he loved and that he sought. And so in Psalm 19, David writes a song that is so powerful that when it was sung in the presence of Saul, it drove away those demons that were haunting him. little lesson here. John Piper has an interesting take on demonism. You know what he says? He says that, that confronting demons with the word of God will drive them away. Not us, not being, you know, like the seven sons of Siva with some magic, but with the word of God will drive them away. We see that in David's life. David singing to to King Saul on his harp these songs. And it's very possible that the 19th Psalm was one of them because it reflects his shepherd times. Just look at the 19th Psalms. Uh, Verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. Can you see David laying on the hillside, making sure that the sheep that were in their little pen, their little fold with the piled rocks that David was sitting in the doorway of and and guarding them, and he's looking up at the brilliant stars, and he's saying, those heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day, during the day they utter speech. Night unto night they reveal knowledge about God. There's no speech or language where their voice isn't heard. Their line has gone through all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. He's saying God has revealed himself in creation. Now God revealed that truth to David and David spoke it because he saw it as God revealed it to him and he made it into this beautiful psalm. And he said, 
And in them he has set a tabernacle for the son, verse 5, who is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, rejoices like a strong man to run the race. Its rising is from one end of heaven, its circuit to the other. There's nothing hidden from its heat. And now David transitions into the powerful word of God. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And I can just see Saul, by the time David was singing that, coming out of his stupor of that demon-induced uh, trouble that, that he was going through. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Now David believed that. Solomon was the richest king that ever lived because David was the, the man who cornered the wealth of the world. If you ever measure how much David had at the end of his life, David had more than half of all the wealth of the whole planet in his lifetime. He had it all gathered for the temple. It was in the billions and billions of dollars today of gold. He had a 100,000 talents of gold. A talent is 60 pounds. So he had 6 million pounds of gold that's 100 million ounces it's just unbelievable amount of gold and he had a million talents that's 60 million pounds of silver again an astronomical amount of money and and look what he says he says your words are more to me than much fine gold verse 10 they're also sweeter than the sweetest thing that humans knew of at that time, honey in the honeycomb. He says, you are a greater treasure than the greatest treasure, and you are a greater satisfaction than the, the tastiest things on earth. Your word. No wonder God liked him so much. Verse 11, moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping them is, there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Boy, is that a great heart attitude as a young person. He said, I don't want any life-dominating sins to start wrapping me up. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. And here's the key to his life. Because I believe the 19th Psalm is all about pleasing God, not pleasing myself. And he said, I want to please God because he says, I want the words of my mouth and I want the meditations of my heart to be acceptable in your sight. I don't want to please myself. I want to please anybody but you, God. In your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Psalm 19, one of the first recorded capturing of the working of God in his heart, very likely part of his repertoire as he ministered to Saul. And he said, God, I want to please you. So David broke with the crowd. As a young person, he stopped getting and seeking approval from his peers and went straight to the top. And no wonder he's such a magnificent example. He wanted God and God alone to approve of his life. And that was his lifelong desire. Except in the matter of Bathsheba. And Uriah, all the rest of his life, as he worked, as he was a famous musician, a composer, as he was a king, as he was a warrior, as he was a businessman, as he was a father, he says, God, you're my goal. I mean, what a goal in life. Well, turn now to Psalm 23. 23rd Psalm is probably another product of this time of his life, the, the 1 Samuel 16 time of his life. And, and he was following the good shepherd. That was the way of his life. David had watched many sheep for much of his life. 1 Samuel 16, 11, 19, and chapter 17, verses 15 and 20. Those four passages, real close together, all find him with uh, sheep. So David spent a long time watching sheep. And he learned something. You know, in, instead of saying, Ugh, those dumb sheep, those stinky sheep, those, those, those constantly, you know, trying my patient sheep, always wandering away, never know what to do. They've got to be led to the water. They can't even find it themselves. You know what he said? He says, wow, 
I'm so much like those sheep. And God, you're so much a perfect shepherd because you feed me and you lead me and you protect me and you anoint me. You see, he he was different. By God's grace, he was different. And David was following the good shepherd. And he said, I can walk through life with confidence because it was settled for him. The Lord was David's shepherd and he was one of the Lord's sheep. And David had it all figured out. The, the, his flock were supposed to follow him, and as long as his flock followed, as long as David's flock followed David, they would be safe, they would be watered, they would be fed, they would be medicined, whatever they needed. And he said, Ah, God is my shepherd. As long as I follow him, I will be fed and I will be refreshed. And he goes right through. You see how simple his life was? Look at Psalm 23, his confession of what it's like to follow the good shepherd for all of your life. The Lord is my shepherd, and if I follow him, I will not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. See, all of these truths David experienced because he wanted and he sought. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even if I walk through the valley of death's shadow, I won't fear any evil. Not because it's not there. It's because... Thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. He was certainly grateful and contented. You know what a lot of people do? They go through life with half a cup and and talking and moaning that it's half full instead of seeing that God, when he's in charge of our life, even when our family neglects us and our brothers don't like us and our dad ignores us and we're neglected and abused and whatever else, that God will make our cup run over. And verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. All I have to do is slow down. They'll catch up and overflow me. You know, Next time you're driving a boat, drive real fast and then stop quickly in the lake and watch what happens. Comes in over the back. That's what life is like. Most of us are going far too fast. We're exceeding the speed limit. And if we would slow down a little bit, the goodness and mercy that's following us all of our days will just overflow our lives. And look, here's the ending. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He said, unlike the sheep who have to live outside in this little, this little sheepfold, he said, my good shepherd is taking me home. And I get to live with him. Well, let's go back to 1 Samuel 17 because uh, some more is going to happen. The same David that's anointed in chapter 16 and has the Holy Spirit come on him and immediately uh, starts the singing these psalms and perhaps in this time period initially has the words to the 19th and the 23rd psalms already coursing through his heart, now comes to chapter 17. And chapter 17 is amazing. After singing to Saul in chapter 16 and most likely composing what we just read in 19 and 23 of the Psalms, David is facing the greatest confrontation of his life. It's greater than any other event of his life. And you all know the story of Goliath. We know it so well. It's captured in 58 verses. But what we often overlook is the 45th verse. So turn down to chapter 17, verse 45, because David said to the Philistine, here's why I am running down the hill. If you know anything about you know, where this battle took place, uh, the, the Israelites were, were on the top of the hill that led upwards into a valley that ended at the heart of Israel in Jerusalem, the Kidron Valley, the, the valley that went up and would go all the way up to where the city of Jerusalem was. And that, that confluence that's where the Kidron and the, the Valley of Hinnom meet, that goes all the way down to the Battle of the Philistines, where we are right here at Elah, or the Pistachio Valley. Pist- Elah means pistachio. It's where pistachio trees were growing. But, but the Israelites were camped right in the heart of that pass. They didn't want the Philistines to go inland. And the Philistines were coming up from the coastal area and were 
were parked on this hill, and there was this little brook between, and then there's this hill going up to that valley, and here's the two, two groups. And David comes over here, and in verse 45, he, he starts down talking. Uh, you know, he says, uh, you come to me with sword. You're up there on the hill walking out from your camp. And I'm coming to you, verse 45. And by the way, he goes down, gets those rocks. And if you notice the story, he starts running uphill, facing the whole army and the giant. I mean, what a scene. Greatest confrontation of David's life. And David said to the Philistine, verse 45, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name. See, David was very alarmed. Do you remember what happens in verse 26? David said, what's going to be done about the man uh, who takes away the reproach of Israel? The end of verse 26, this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God. See, David had one concern. Verse 45 captures it. David was concerned about the name of the Lord of hosts, verse 45, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. David was not in it for the money, the glory. Uh, he didn't like, you know, fighting particularly. Certainly wasn't in it. His brothers were already there. He, you know, he's going to have to face them. They're already picking on him. The, what got him into this situation was, you have defied the name of the Lord. Now, in my Bible, and, and if you want to do something like this, it's kind of fun. From this scene... David writes a psalm. It's the 8th psalm. So let's turn now to the 8th psalm. And I actually wrote in my Bible Psalm 8. And I want to show you uh, what's so amazing about this psalm because this reflects David's motivation for fighting Goliath. And by the way, the the preface to the psalm, the superscript, the first verse in the Hebrew um, Bible, is to the chief musician on an instrument of gath or gittith or gittite. It's something to do with Gath. And, and of course, we know that Goliath of Gath. And so it's interesting that it seems like David worked into that, this idea of Gath. But look what the psalm opens with, verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your what in all the earth? Your name. And then look at the very last verse of the 8th psalm. What does he say? O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your what? Your name. Yeah. And you know what's interesting? Uh, we aren't sure if, if you have a Bible that has the first verse of the Hebrew manuscript, verse 9, I mean chapter 9, the ninth Psalm, has a little superscript uh, before the ninth Psalm. And it says, to the chief musician, to the tune of Muthlaban, the death of a son. It's very possible that that, that is reflecting back you know, the one thing that the Hebrew um, scholars are not sure about is whether these little statements to the chief musician, all that, whether, whether they go on the end of the psalm or on the front. Because remember, the psalms just all run together. They're in scrolls, and they're not divided. They're just words, and they just go like that. And so it's interesting that this psalm begins in, in the superscript of the eighth psalm. It's about Gath, and it ends with the death. It's a psalm about death. And, and so for whatever, however this goes, historically the 8th Psalm has thought to be David living for the glory of his name, not mine. See what David says? He says, your name is to be glorious, not mine. See, David, the whole 8th Psalm is his motivation for facing Goliath. And that's why God could use David to defeat Goliath because David wasn't trying to make a name for himself. Now, he did. He became one of the mightiest warriors of all time. But God got all the credit. And that's what the Lord wants in life. God wants his name to be glorified in all the earth. Well, there are two more, and we'll just turn to them. We aren't going to read them tonight. Look at Psalm 101 with me. And we're going to pick up and try and get through these. This is a psalm of David, and its psalm is the sacred pledge that David made for purity. And we're going to look at this psalm, and this is when David revealed his list of resolves 
for his young years. Um, Most likely he wrote this later in life, but it was when he looked back at why God so blessed his life. And it's his his sacred pledge of purity. And there's, if you read the 101st Psalm, it's all about him saying, I'm not going to have sin in my life. I'm not going to have improper heroes. I'm not going to let sin cling to me. I'm going to scrape it off. I'm going to avoid it. I'm not going to do that. And then keep going to the 132nd Psalm. This also is a psalm from early on in his life, written at a later time. But he talks about being a shepherd boy in the 132nd Psalm. And in the 132nd Psalm, the 101st is about his purity. The 132nd is, is a psalm about his holy habits. He had these habits. Um, verse 3 of Psalm 132, he wouldn't go to bed or to the comfort of his house or sleep until he found, verse 5, a place for the Lord. You see where that no Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bunk stuff comes from? David says, I, I can't let a day go by without God. Now, in our world, I can't let a day go by without media or without music or without, you know, the Internet. David said, I can't let a day go by without God. You see his holy habit? And, and, and on through. So the 132nd, David is pursuing his holy, godly walk with the Lord. And in Psalm 101, he is talking about his, his purity and how he wants to guard that for the Lord. And the conclusion of David's life is, the sum of David's life, is that David made time for God. As a little boy, he didn't bemoan shepherding. He made time for God. In his work, he incorporated God into his work. If he was going to work for Saul, he was going to sing his songs about God. When he was, was alone and had time alone, he had these holy habits. When he had temptations, he had his resolves for purity. He made time for God and included God. The sum of David's life is that despite loneliness, affliction, hardship, disappointments, David made a regular choice to set aside time for God. Love demands intimacy. When you love someone or something, you devote hours to whatever it is you love. David loved God. So David devoted hours to fleeing sin, seeking the Lord, to sorrowing over his failures. When we get to that next section of his life, David sorrows over his failures. He writes song after song, seven penitential psalms where he's sorry. And he rejoiced in God's mercy. Father, I thank you that the man after your own heart took time. Took time to reflect on you when he was alone, when he was sad, when he was on the run, when he was afraid, when he was tempted, even when he was defeated and crushed by the load of his sin, he always came out with a song directed at you because David loved you. And I pray tonight, Lord, that we would love you, the Lord our God, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, and that it wouldn't stop there, that we, as you said, would love our neighbor as ourselves. And thus fulfill the whole law and thus have a life that speaks of you. And then when necessary, we can open our mouths and tell people about you. But our life loudly declares, like David's, that we have made time for you. And we look more like you and we're conformed into your image because we, with open faces, behold you in the mirror of your word. I pray for all those that started out this year with such gusto reading that we would renew our longing after you, that we would even this day spend time with you, end our day in prayer with you, having your word on our hearts and allowing you to let us be your servants. Thank you. And we pray for your blessing as we go. And all of God's people said, amen. And let's live for the Lord as we go.